Hello, Discover Freedom podcast listeners. We are back again to talk all things Enneagram, and I am thrilled to introduce my special guest for today. You all know him as the author of The Road Back to You, El Camino de Regreso a Ti in Español, but he is also a psychotherapist, Episcopal priest, Enneagram teacher, host of the podcast Typology, and the best-selling author of several other books, Jesus, My Father, The CIA, and Me, Chasing Francis, and The Story of You. Stick around because you won't want to miss this conversation with Ian Morgan Cron. Ian Morgan Cron, thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm so excited to have you. Welcome. I'm really thank you. It's it's a pleasure. Yes, I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you. Um, I know when I originally re- reached out to you, I mentioned a little bit to you about how I have had the privilege of working with the Spanish speaking community with the Enneagram. And I started back in 2019 as a certified coach. And um, I would speak with people and we'd have conferences and everyone would refer to the book, which they were referring to the road back to you. Um, Not a lot of stuff is still translated into Spanish. And so it might've been one of the first. Um, And so we also have a kind of uh, our, hand in a lot of different areas in the faith community um, in Latin America. And so um, I've been just wanting to get you on here, hear from you. This episode will be subtitled so people can um, hear what's behind your books now. um, And we'll get to talk about all of those things. Um, But I want to start with the road back to you. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit from you about that book. And a big question I have is, are you, are you, surprised, I guess, at that um, impact that it's had, not just across the southern border into Latin America, but across the world. Of course. Who knew? <laughs> um, <clears throat> when, I, when I wrote The Road Back to You, I had an uh, intuition that it would do pretty well, um, but I had no idea how, how well it would do. I think we've sold probably an, you know, well over a million copies. And I, I just had no idea that wow. it would spark the level of interest that it has. And of course, I'm delighted and really grateful. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I thought it was so interesting that I would talk to people and they would refer to your book as the book. And um, I always would clarify, no, you're talking about the road back to you. Um, how did you hear about that book? How did you hear about the Enneagram? But it's been, I just started to realize this pattern of how um, influential your book has been in the Spanish speaking community. And I just think that's mm-hmm. so great. Um, it's such a great um, intro or primer, if you will, into what the Enneagram is. I think it's, um, I actually, I have all your books here with me. I've, I'm a fan. I've read uh, Jesus, My Father, the CIA, CIA and Me. <laughs> I've read uh, Chasing Francis. I have them all here. And I, of course, have the Spanish copy, El Camino de Regreso a Ti. Um, such great stories because you are a good storyteller. And so I think that there's um, this fun and excitement about reading your books. And it's not just this information that's being thrown at you, but people read them and they, they connect with the stories that are in them, um, which I, I think is just, it, it's fun. And I think that the title of your new book, which I understand will be eventually translated into Spanish and hopefully we'll be announcing that soon. Um, but it's, it's titled The Story of You. Um, the subtitle is, uh, I have it here. Um, oops, where did I put it? It's, uh, the probably, subtitle is an Enneagram Journey to Becoming Your True Self. An Enneagram Journey to Becoming Your True Self. Exactly. Where did the idea come from for that book? Well, you know, I um, um, as a therapist, I was fascinated by this idea that the Enneagram not only described nine personality types, but really nine narratives or stories that each type tells itself about who they are and how they think the world works. And once you understand the narrative in which you find yourself living, the narrative that you adopted uh, as a small child to help you understand yourself in the world, um, it, it fascinated me that, that about the possibility that, you know, we could change the narrative in which we oftentimes find ourselves imprisoned, um, and begin to experience a new level of happiness and freedom. Yeah, 
exactly. That's so good. Um, a lot of the work that I do, um, what my husband and I with other ministry opportunities that we have, but also with the Enneagram is working with people and their relationships. Um, the, our intro to the Enneagram, my husband and I was um, through, um, we were doing some training to plan a church and we had never heard of it. And we, after having that impactful moment of, oh my gosh, that they see into my soul, they're giving me this language that I never um, had to explain who I am. We started applying it to our marriage and using it as a tool. And it's definitely been, been the tool that we have found most growth with. And so I think that's where my heart has been is working with other people, whether it's in their marriage or family relationships, friendships. Um, so I would love for you to tell everyone that's listening, um, how can someone's story and rewriting their story have an impact on relationships, whether it's marriage, friendships, family, et cetera? Well, just as a, <clears throat> by way of introduction, I, th I do think that all of us understand our lives narratively, right? Mm -hmm. We understand them as stories that are unfolding. And we do adopt a story as children that helps us make sense of our experiences. And the story is largely made up of internalized messages that we pick up right. from parents and coaches and friends and culture. Um, and those stories really help us as little kids, help us make mm -hmm. sense of the world. And so the one has a story, the two has a story, the three yeah. has a story, right? And uh, those, again, those stories help us as little people. Those stories do become our personalities. Right. Like your personality is, is built around a story. Mm. But then we bring those stories into adulthood. And at that point, they mostly work against us, right? Mm -hmm. they, yep. begin to, they begin to undermine uh, our relationships with other people. Yeah. So tell me your type. I'm a one. Okay. So the story that ones tell themselves uh, is based upon the mistaken idea that the world only rewards good people and it mm -hmm. judges bad people. Right. And that in, in order to find love and a sense of control in the world, um, that they have to perfect or improve themselves, others, and the environment, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, or, or more broadly, um, social systems that are broken, right? Because there are certain yes. ones who are focused on that sort of, their attention migrates more toward that. Right. Um, and then we call them the reformer ones. Now, mm -hmm. the, the problem is, of course, is that the, the idea that in order to win love and control in the world, that you have to perfect yourselves, others in the environment, though it may help you as a little kid get strokes and survive in adulthood, you know, that begins to make a mess of relationships. Oh yes. it does. <laughs> so what I want to do through my book, the story of you is help you see how broken that story is that right. that story imprisons you and locks you into predictable patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving that really hurts you now. And how do we begin to break free of that of those patterns and the trance of that old broken childhood story? That's so good. That's so good. Um, side note: I love the name Improver. Um, I have thought and thought and thought because I I have a hard time with the names of some of the types, and being a one, I feel it has to be perfect, and none of the names are perfect. <laughs> And so not all of the ones are perfectionists, not all of the ones have that reforming um, focus. And so when I heard you say improver, I thought that's great, but I cannot find a good Spanish word that sounds oh. right. So I'm still looking, I'm still looking, but that, that was genius because I think that that fits across the board, all the subtypes. Um, we are all trying to improve something. I lean more towards being um, uh, uh, well, my subtype would be more of conservation. And so I'm very focused on my family, my home, what's right here in front of me. Um, but I'm not a perfectionist in everything. And so when you said improver, right. I thought, man, that is, that's great. That is exactly what I feel like I am. Yes. <clears throat> you know, I often tell people, I'm not so sure that, that improvers 
necessarily want to perfect everything. They don't necessarily believe they can perfect everything. Right. But they're sure going to try. Yes. <laughs> right. So they, yes. they've, most, most improvers don't think they can perfect their house or their friends, or other, but they're going to try. Oh, yeah. And that's the thing to remember. Yes, exactly. No, I, I, I agree. Um, well, I think that that's great. And I love using stories as a background. Again, you're a great storyteller. So I think it fits perfectly uh, when I saw that book come out. And I love the fact that you can take people back to the stories that began at such a young age um, and begin to teach people how to rewrite those. I think part of it is also accepting them. I think the Enneagram, one of the things I love about it is that it helps from the very, from the very beginning, from the entry level, being able to accept some of the things that need to be rewritten or changed or improved. And so I think that that book, the topic is very needed. I think it's a great follow-up to the road back to you and that entry level understanding of the Enneagram. Um, I just think it's great. I really do. Mm. Thank you so much. I'm glad. Yeah. And I'm excited to, to get it in Spanish whenever that comes out. So you'll have to keep me updated. We will. I'm, I'm fairly certain. I'm surprised it isn't out already. I know it's out in French. It's out in like a bunch of Eastern European languages. Oh, interesting. So yeah, I'm sure it's just a matter of time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it is. If you are listening today and haven't yet read The Road Back to You, don't wait and grab your copy today. The Road Back to You in both English and Spanish, as well as Ian's new book, The Story of You, are available everywhere books are sold. Also, take a moment to look up the Typology podcast on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platforms. You will love listening to Ian interview all Enneagram types and touch on every area of life and how the Enneagram can be an amazing tool for self-awareness and growth. Let's get back to the interview. Um, I also want to touch on a couple general Enneagram things with you. Um, I use a lot of your examples from whether it's a podcast that I've heard from you or one of your books. Um, but one of the things that I really would like to hear from you about is your journey in discovering your type. I know that you have come across this um, an umpteenth amount of times where you run into people that are eager to know their number be able to proclaim, this is my Enneagram number, this is my type. Um, they think that it's going to be the end all for understanding themselves. And so there's this rush to either know my type or to type someone else um, and push them into this process. But I remember whether it was your book or on a, on a uh, podcast, hearing you talk about how long it took you to really define that. And so I would love for you to talk to us a little bit about that journey and the importance of the process. Sure. Well, in fact, it was kind of embarrassing because I'm a, <laughs> I'm a therapist, you know, I'm a, an Episcopal priest. I'm a trained spiritual director. I, you know, I thought, man, I'm going to nail my type in a heartbeat. That's not what happened. <laughs> it took me, it took me, if I recall, 10 months before I figured out, really figured out my type. Right. If you believe, if you believe in assessments and I, I think assessments are helpful in that they give you a data point. That, you know, right. it's not definitive, but it is a good data point. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I always came out as a three or a seven, a three, four or seven. Okay. And I was like, I was like, how does a four come out like a seven or a three? I mean, it just didn't make any <laughs> sense. Right. Right. The, the type I most identified with was a four, but I'm not somebody who necessarily kind of radiates suffering or okay. melancholy. Um, right. And then when I really began to dig into subtypes, mm. I, I, I remember reading uh, about the self-preservation. It sounds like you refer to it as conservation. Yeah, but... um, self-preservation or in Spanish, it's autoconservación. So yeah, self-preservation. Okay. So I realized, oh my gosh, I'm what they call the sunny four, uh, mm. which is which is the counter type of the exactly. four. And so I often look like a three or a seven, but my core motivation is absolutely that of a four. Right. So uh, when that 
I remember coming across that and going, oh my gosh, that nails me. And, and so this actually raises a point, which is, you know, once you know your basic type, you get a low resolution picture of your personality. Right, then I suppose you could say that when you get to, let's leave wings aside for a moment. Well, then, then when you get your subtype, you get a much higher resolution picture yeah. of your personality. So I always tell people, look, if you just want to know your type, that's great. You'll get something out of it. However, if you really want to go deeper and understand your type more broadly, then you have to really go into subtypes. Yes, no, exactly. So subtypes helped you a lot. And I've also heard you say that you have a heavy three wing, which I'm sure um, gave off some of that three energy a lot. Yeah, it did. I would also say that as I've gotten older, I'm more and more of a five wing. Okay. Um, and that's fairly normal, you know, yeah. that uh, you your wing can migrate. Also, one thing that people tend to misunderstand about wings is they think they only have one. Right. So, you know, you can either be a four with a three or a two with a one. It's like, actually, yeah. you have two, you have two wings. Otherwise, yes. like, a bird, like a bird, if you only had one wing, you'd be flying in circles. Exactly. Right? So, <laughs> yep. you know, so you have to have two wings. It's just that one is dominant. Right. Um, and so I think the energy of my three wing is kind of migrating over to more of a five wing. And I see yes. that more and more as I get older. And do you feel like that's been more of a natural thing or have you had to be intentional on in that at all? No, it's pretty natural. Yeah, I, I asked because I have, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, my wife would say that over, over probably the last 10 years, um, I've become much more um, introverted than I was mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a younger man. Um, I'm a little bit less focused on, I'm a little, not, not less ambitious. I'm just less driven than I was right. as, a, as a younger man. And I've always been kind of bookish, you know, uh -huh. like I've always, I've always been somebody, like I can be pretty nerdy about certain topics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, kind of, I can get into a topic and spend the next five years reading every single book on it and right, kind okay. of becoming, you know, very fixed on it. So, right, again, right. you know, two wings, maybe in transition. Okay. I asked just because I have been very intentional and in trying to use my nine wing more because I have a very heavy two wing. I always have, I think, um, but again, the, with the Enneagram, the point is, you know, first this self-discovery and this self-awareness, but also growth. And so I love how when you actually take the time to learn about these things, wings, for example, um, you can use intentionality and your knowledge of, of the Enneagram to, in my case, lean towards some of those healthy nine traits, try to lean away from of the, some of the um, unhealthy two wing traits that I so often would use before. Um, and so I've tried, once I discovered the Enneagram and really started working with it to be more intentional and in that. Um, and I think, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say that I think the Enneagram is also largely about balance. So mm -hmm. you, you wanna, if you possibly can, you wanna balance your wings. You wanna, yeah. balance, your, you wanna balance your centers of intelligence. You wanna yep. balance your, you wanna bring your subtypes into balance. You wanna bring, yeah, that's good. You, know, um, you know, your time orientation into balance. You know, there's just, it, it's so much of it is how do we become more whole? And, you know, rather than over privileging or leaning too hard into certain, you know, uh, dimensions of our right. personality and yeah. bring it more into a, a holistic, balanced uh, state. Right. No, that's great. And I'm glad you say that because I, I believe I get the question a lot. I'm sure you do. How is the Enneagram any different than Myers-Briggs, than DISC, than all these other systems that are great? And I've used them in the past and they've been helpful to, to me, to my husband and his businesses. Um, I think that the Enneagram is more holistic. I think that's the word. Um, and it touches, if we let it, every area of our life and can bring about that growth in every area of our life, which is um, so needed. Uh, mm -hmm. So 
Yeah, that's a good word. Um, another question that I wanted to ask you. So I think that at least with the people I have talked to, some of your um, probably most well-known words from the road back to you are, I'm gonna read them. The Enneagram doesn't put you in a box. It shows you the box you're already in and how to get out of it. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to speak a couple minutes to any skeptics that might be listening that feel like the Enneagram is a waste of time or a scam. What would you say to those people? Well, first of all, there's always doubters. Uh, there's always mm -hmm. people who even temperamentally tend to be leery, you know, about yeah. uh, tests and personality stuff. Look, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't try to make over, I don't try, I don't make too many promises with the, I don't over promise. Right. right. I, I tend to be someone actually who I think is pretty balanced and realistic about the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. It's not magic. Right. It's, you know, it's not the gospel. It's exactly. not, <laughs> it's not the most important secret information in the world, you know? And, and when I hear people talk about it that way, I'm always a little bit like, okay, you're going a little too far here. Yes. Okay? <laughs> and, and oftentimes when people have objections and I start to tell them, look, it's not perfect, but it's really yeah. useful. Yeah. Then a lot of times their guard goes down. You know, mm -hmm. I think a lot of times people get suspicious when people talk up something too much and get right. too enthousi get enthusiastic to the point that it's a little kooky, uh -huh. you know? Uh, and I'm always like, oh yeah, I'd be a little leery too if somebody came in and said, this is the answer to all of life's problems. And if you right. really... This is going to help you perfectly understand yourself and others. No, not so much. It, yeah. It's just going to be, it's going to be really helpful. Even if it gave you 10% more insight into who you are and who yeah. others are, that's a huge leap forward. Exactly. So don't over promise. You know, that's what I say right. to them. Like, you know, I'm not saying that this is the, like I said, the, the great mystery is now solved as a result of the right. immigrant. Then they go, oh, okay, I'm more open now. Right, exactly. Okay, no, that's good. That's good. And I, I agree. I feel like um, people, once they just read a little bit and they realize it's not, and you used a word that I use a lot, it's not the gospel. It's not the new doctrine out there. Um, it's simply a tool. And when we are willing to learn about it and to start applying that knowledge, to our life, there, there is growth. And if it's all, if it stops with me, then that's better than nothing. Right. If I can mm -hmm. then apply it. I mean, we've used it in our marriage as parents now, and it's, I mean, I can't stop speaking about how much it's helped us, but it requires someone to do their own work in it and to learn about it. Um, mm -hmm. And something that I love too, about the Enneagram is the fact that yes, it's, it can get very deep. There's so many concepts. There's so many aspects. But I love that no matter where you start with it, you can find growth there. And then if you want to learn more, then take the next step and learn about another aspect of the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. um, but even just taking it in bite-sized pieces, um, I think is so helpful. Um, something that you said, and I think that it, it would be great to hear from you on this too. So as I mentioned, um, a lot of the people that I work with are from faith communities. My husband and I have, uh, we founded back in 2011, a church planting organization, um, evangelical churches, mostly in Latin America. And so when I started teaching the Enneagram, there was a little bit of a, uh, uh, maybe a kickback from some of the people that we had been working with originally. Um, some of it was as simple as the logo is doesn't look very godly. <laughs> Some of it was people that had actually looked into it a little bit and um, were very leery about it and wondered how in the world could I be teaching about God and then also be teaching about the Enneagram, which I love talking to people about that. Um, but what would you say to that? How do you answer those questions? Well, well first of all, um, the Enneagram has Christian roots. Mm -hmm. it, it it's not um you know it was an oral tradition until the 1970s but we know that uh going back to the desert monk uh, evagrius ponticus that yeah you know it, it has solid christian roots in the catholic tradition it was used for many years as a tool for training young you know uh 
they're called novices, people who are in training to become priests in spiritual formation. Right. Um, you, know what's, you know what's so interesting, at least here in the United States, I expected that I was going to get some pushback and I virtually got none. And huh, okay. the book, the, the book and, uh, was uh, critically reviewed in, I mean, just about every Christian publication there was, and all the reviews were positive. Oh, okay. That's um, good. And, and it's been endorsed by countless, very well-known uh, evangelical pastors here in the United States. So there's yeah. really no, there's no reason to be anxious uh, about it. Right. And so, you know, there are just some people who are naturally anxious. There are a lot of sixes who get anxious <laughs> about everything. So, yes. you know, the proof is, how's this? The, it, the proof is in the pudding. If a person just checks it out and they go, oh, this can help me on my journey toward becoming a more Christ-like person, it, it, it doesn't take long before you figure that out. Right, right. exactly. So, and by the way, are there kooky people out there teaching the Enneagram? You bet there are. You <laughs> right. Bet. But there are crazy people out there teaching Myers-Briggs and StrengthsFinder. And I mean, you can find people teach. You can take anything good and twist it. Exactly. So, you know, so be discerning. Just make sure that your right. sources uh, are, you know, really have been proven to be consistent with the message of the gospel. Pretty simple. Right. Good. That's good stuff. Um, so I have one more question for you. A lot of the people that listen to my podcast or that follow along with the things that I teach um, probably wouldn't be able to listen to your podcast uh, because it's in English. And I would love for you, if you can think of any, maybe uh, some of your favorite moments or favorite interviews. I listen sometimes. I, I love the ones where you're talking to people and in the moment you realize, huh, this person isn't actually the type that I'm interviewing them as. <laughs> and so you get into a kind of a typing interview, but is there anything that, whether it's from your podcast or teaching, but just any uh, stories that you can tell us um, that have been some of your favorite moments teaching the Enneagram? Oh my gosh. There've been so many and I've done <laughs> at least 250 shows. So for yeah. me to figure out, to kind of pull one out would be difficult. Right, right. Um, I, I think the Claire de Diaz Ortiz one was very, very good. That was um, great. And, Two parts, and, and right? So, yes. And in the first part, we determined she was not a one, she was a three. And yes. then the next time we had her on, she had done all this research on threes and she was floored. Yes, I remember uh, that. And, <laughs> and so for her unpacking what that did to her and how yeah. it, it had sort of upended everything for her. Um, and I think those shows were kind of spread out. I think like six months between okay. the first one and the second one. And boy, oh boy, that second conversation was really moving. Uh, yes. To, just to see how much it had impacted her life. Um, yeah. And again, there's been so many shows, it's hard for me to pick one, but I'm oftentimes very, there's a lot of times in that show when people become profoundly moved. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I don't try to make manipulate people into going there. Yeah. Um, oftentimes just as a therapist, I'm able to spot something going on and tease it out. And it, it, it ends up with it being a moving experience for people. Right. Um, so, I mean, I, I love that that show gives other people a chance to talk about their experience as a type. Right. Right. And yeah. Because then I'm not describing the inner experience of other people. It's coming directly from that person. And they're always, yeah. more, artic they're always more articulate than I am. Right. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the, the benefit of that show, if, any, if nothing else. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and you, you said what the last thing I was going to talk about with you. Um, you can't really... I mean, you and I, any other Enneagram teacher, we can teach about every type. We can teach all the knowledge that we know, the, the experiences that we've had with other people, but it's actually listening to someone talk about their type um, that is the most impactful, I think. And when people really connect 
um, that might be their, their aha moment of this is, this is me. Like they understand me. They, they know what's going on in, inside of my heart and my mind. Um, and I would love for you to share with us um, just a little bit from the heart of a four as a four, any advice that you have to, to other fours out there. Um, because I think that that's, that can be very uh, special to the people that are listening that are fours or that live with other fours. Mm. Well, I think fours are the most complex number on the Enneagram. Um, I think that probably nines are the least complex. It doesn't mean okay. that doesn't make them simple. It just right. means that usually with nines, what you see is what you get. Yes. Right. And yep. with fours, what you see is never what you get. It's never, yeah. it's almost like, it's almost like when, just when you think you got to the bottom of the four, you realize, oh my gosh, <laughs> there, is, there is no bottom. Yes. Um, and, and I think, I think the, let me put it this way. The, the broken story, if I'm going to talk in the language of my new book, the story of you, yeah. the, the broken story of the four is based on this uh, mistaken notion that they are missing something important in their essential makeup that everybody else seems to have without which they will never know wholeness or belonging or, yeah. uh, or, or any sense of connection and happiness. Right. And that's a very broken story. I can tell you from my experience, it helped me make sense of the world as a little kid. And mm. without a, and without a narrative, you're really in trouble. So even a narrative that's not great, at least it's sustaining you. Right. Um, the problem is I dragged that story into adulthood and it really made a mess of my life, as is the case with all types, if they continue to yep. live in the broken story of their type. And yep. so I would say to fours, the first thing they have to do is, you know, identify their type to see, to see it, to really unpack it then to own how it has affected their lives uh, and the lives of others with, in, mm -hmm. a way that's very, in a way that's very self-compassionate, but honest. Right. And then they have to awaken to um, and develop enough self-knowledge and awareness that they can see when they've begun to fall back into living in the old story Mm -hmm. they, they, yep. they need to, and then they need to be able to counter the story with a new story. Yeah. And, and the new story would include things like um, equanimity, right? Developing mm -hmm. the capacity to um, face life's difficulties on life's terms. Right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it, I think it involves um, a reversal in, in the belief that there's something uh, that there's something missing that they have to compensate for through presenting or <laughs> projecting an image of specialness and uniqueness. Right. It's, it's not, it's just not necessary. So the new story would involve uh, challenging those old beliefs yeah. and articulating the ones they now want to live by as adults. Mm, that's good. So good. And I think so healing too. Um, again, when someone can hear that from someone that really understands it, really knows it, has been through that process. Um, so that's good. Um, so again, just to wrap it up here. So the road back to you, El Camino de Regreso a Ti, um, the story of you coming soon in Spanish. We'll keep our fingers crossed for that release date. Um, typology podcast for those that do and are able to listen in, in English. Um, thank you so much for the contribution that you have given and continue to give to the Enneagram world. Um, I know that it's been impactful for me. And as I mentioned at the beginning, for so many people that I talk to and I work with, um, we give every new church that we open through our organization, we give this copy of, of the book. Um, again, it's not saying the Enneagram is a new doctrine. It's saying this is a tool that we know will help you in this process. Um, starting anything, a church, excuse me, an organization, a business, knowing yourself, understanding yourself, being able to know that narrative, rewrite that story um, is going to be such a huge part of, of any process. Um, 
and to seeing the the fruit and the success of that that project. So thank you again for all of those things. And um, I will continue to to listen in. And um, maybe now that we'll be kind of neighbors in Tennessee, um, I'll get to be at a, an event or something like that. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so again, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a delight. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And thank you for being on the Discover Freedom podcast. Today.